Hi, good afternoon, everybody. We're just waiting for the session to fill up. So thank you for the early birds who've uh, signed in. Uh, we'll just wait for a few more people to join the session. So please bear with us. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Just another public service announcement. Uh, we are just waiting for the attendees to fill up. So we'll give it a few more minutes and hopefully everybody can join uh, and make their way across from the different sessions and from lunch as well. So uh, we'll get started shortly, but uh, just trying to give the benefit of the doubt for all those who are maybe trying to log in or struggling to log in. So we'll start very shortly. Thank you. Okay, I think that uh, gives enough time for everybody uh, to try to have made their ways through. Uh, hopefully we'll see some more attendees uh, added to the session as we go through, but thank you so much for joining us after lunch. I think it's always a difficult session to run. Uh, we're in parallel session number three, uh, and the focus on this section is really about technological disruption and implications. Uh, so uh, as you probably heard this morning, the Honorable Minister was talking about the, the use of Helm online program. And uh, we are fortunate enough to be from a company called Instructure that is behind that as well. So uh, my name is Ewan Presents and I manage our efforts in Africa, Middle East and Eastern Europe. And very humbled and proud uh, when uh, Dr. Seal asked us if we could be uh, part of the session and hopefully we can, uh, uh, we can drive and build some value for you. Uh, we think we've got a really good uh, panel of speakers. Uh, we've got some speakers from Sweden, the Netherlands, the UK, and of course, South Africa. So we hope that it's a good session for you. And some of the points that they talk about are relatable. I think just one or two housekeeping items before we get started. I think that the session is meant to be uh, interactive and generative, so we'd like some conversation. And as much as the panelists will be responsible for a lot of that, uh, we do ask that you guys use the chat function. So please pose any comments or questions in there. Uh, we will moderate and try to lift that to the panel. Uh, so we do ask for your participation in that as well, as much as I think the panelists will have uh, quite a lot of uh, interesting um, perspectives as well. So so 
uh, just a little bit of housekeeping there and we ask you uh, to please be involved as much as you can in the session. Before getting started, I think it's always good to, to maybe introduce the panel. Uh, I think this is always the difficult part in terms of making sure you get everybody's bio just right. Uh, but if we start at the top left and do an introduction there to the first person on the list uh, on your screen is Jenny Paldanius, and she's a project manager for Lund University in Sweden. Uh, she's been there since 2011 and has led many pure IT projects, but also projects in relation to IT and and education. So currently she's the project manager for their Canvas program, uh, where she's responsible for coordinating uh, all cooperation and collaboration around that as well. So a very welcome to Jenny from Sweden. Uh, the next person that you'll see is Maria Hedberg, and she's uh, the second part of that dynamic duo. Uh, Maria is also from Lund University in Sweden. Uh, she's been at Lund a little bit longer, since 2001. Uh, her background is more on e-learning and pedagogical development. So that is a focus and areas of expertise. She is also a project manager for the Canvas program there. And there she's focused on pedagogy, uh, teacher training, accessibility, and uplifting and putting focus on student-centered learning. So very welcome again to the both of them from Sweden. Uh, nice to be part of, of this and we look forward to your inputs as well. The next person on the panel is Mr. Baz Ten Halter, and he's the Regional Vice President for Salesforce in Education. Uh, Baz and I have walked a long path together. Uh, he has a long history in EdTech, I think starting back in the early 90s when I was still in high school. So uh, I think he started off in the student information uh, field as well. Uh, since then, he's introduced uh, probably some of the biggest um, IT uh, EdTech um, uh, initiatives that I've seen as well in Europe um, uh, with partners often at a national level, uh, partners such as SURF in the Netherlands, JISC in the UK, uh, SUNET in Sweden, and UNIT in Norway. So great to have his voice uh, from a trusted industry practitioner, and he's dialing in from the Netherlands. So glad to have you on board, Baz, and look forward to your feedback. Uh, the next person that you'll see there is Dr. Niku Baird, and um, in most of the calls I've had with Niku, he really needs no introduction. Uh, most people seem to know him or know of him uh, in the South African e-learning space. Uh, Dr. Baird has started off uh, in 1995, has a long and distinguished uh, academic career, started off with video theory and practice at CUT, uh, then moved on to UFS, and he's been involved with many universities, uh, helping them uh, progress into blended learning. He was also deputy director for the Center of Teaching and Learning at Wits University and is currently the vice president for academic services. And I always get this one wrong, so I'm going to read it. Uh, for academic partners, partnerships, higher ed partners. Uh, and there he leads their international expansion. So great to have you on board, Nico, and thank you for taking the time. Uh, looking forward to your uh, colorful and unique inputs as well. Uh, the next person that you'll see there is Mr. Sabhanu Saxena, and he's the director for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He spearheads cross-functional uh, initiatives for the foundation, and his real remit is building capabilities to enhance the foundation to be able to scale on special projects and innovations. Uh, he's an acclaimed uh, corporate executive working in a variety of industries across a variety of geographies as well, so uh, very uh, grateful that he could join us bringing a slightly different perspective and voice to the conversation so thank you Subhanu for, for taking the time and joining. The final panelist is uh, Louis Ferry. I believe he also doesn't need much introduction in the South African e-learning scene. Uh, he's a futurist, uh, a technology strategist. He's consulted to governments, industry, uh, organizations, and educational institutions. Uh, he's uh, previously been Deputy Vice Chancellor for uh, Knowledge and Information Services at CPUT. Um, he's also contributed and been involved in numerous research projects uh, spanning human machine cognition business intelligence, uh, digital universities, 4IR, and digital inclusion. So many relatable topical points uh, that we look forward to unpacking and addressing with him as well. 
The final person I would just like to say a hello and thank you to is Russi Lowe from USAF, who uh, for the last week has been helping us all uh, cobble things together. And, and Russi will be uh, watching the chat for us as well. So thank you, Russi, for being a part of this. And thank you to the panelists for taking time uh, out of your uh, schedules as well to, to, to shape uh, the conversation here as well. Right, uh, before getting started, uh, just a final word for me before I start uh, facilitating the conversation with the panelists, and those are probably the people that you want to hear from. Uh, the, the, the topical area we had was quite broad, and what I was trying to do is trying to find an anchor point and trying to find uh, a conceptual framework or some areas where we can kind of always go back to, because as you've heard from the panelists' bios, they're all coming from different points of departure, different specializations as well. And I thought this one specifically worked very well to give us that thin red thread. Uh, and this is from the IDC, and they talk about the future of work framework. Uh, and they talk about three things, really. They talk about the workforce, so the collaboration between humans and technology, they talk about the workspace, so a connected, secure work environment, independent of place and time. And they talk about work culture, which is this final point over here. So engaged and empowered workers uh, that align to new digital skills. So you'll probably hear from the panelists that they'll touch and you know, uh, unpack some areas there as well. We only have a two hour session. And as you probably know, each of those three sessions, you could probably go well, pretty deep on all of them as well. Uh, connectivity, digital assistance, uh, pick your topic. Uh, but hopefully this provides us some sort of a framework in terms of where they're coming from and try to link their different voices together in some sort of uh, coherent form uh, and shape as well. With that being said, um, I would just again uh, like to remind you uh, to please use the chat function and comment and engage with us. I think it is your session as much as it is, is the panelists. So let's try to get the most of it. Uh, and with that being said, I'd like to open the floor to our first panelist uh, from Sweden. And I believe uh, this won't just be Jenny answering this question. I believe uh, Maria will uh, be part of this as well. So I will pose the question and uh, Jenny and Maria will uh, place their response. Um, so. Jenny Maria, as you can see, we've started off with a, a pretty low ball question. <laughs> I think it's quite a complicated question, but but I'll start us off and, and hopefully you can share some of your insights and experiences from Sweden. So from your point of view, what do you think the most will be the most lasting effect of the pandemic on higher education and digital learning? Yes, thanks, Yuen. Um, yes, so we are from Lund University and uh, you need to know that even though Sweden had another strategy uh, in the Corona, uh, we actually did close the university. So 18th of March, um, we started to, um, to do digital learning mostly. Um, and it has uh, had a huge effect on our teachers, of course, and the students. Um, First of all, the digital competence has raised quite a lot. Um, we can also see that a lasting effect is that Zoom, Canvas, other uh, tools, digital tools, are more of an extended classroom, which uh, sets new uh, ways of working with it for us, of course. Um, so um, what, what, what we had before was teachers who didn't really want to use uh, the tools, uh, we, we help them to get started. But nowadays we are actually in a totally different position because they <laughs> happen to raise their digital competence. And today our problem is more like how to get quality in the in their courses, how to do interactivity. So we have a much more interesting discussion really today. And uh, I mean, that will stay for sure. Um, we can also see that we are talking much more about digital learning environments as a whole, instead of those different uh, tools, as we talked about before. So before we had one tool at a time and we could support Canvas or we could support Zoom. But today we need to be more hel helpful for the teacher. We need to talk about learning activities instead. So uh, a support person needs to know all those tools to, to be able to help the teacher. Uh, big difference from before. Uh, so we're talking about support, training and inspiration, where we have to have the whole, the whole picture of uh, the big learning environments with all those tools that belong to it. 
Uh, what else? Yeah, our students, the lasting effect will be that they will have uh, much, uh, well, they, they will demand more from the teachers, of course. They've seen that it works, <laughs> but they also see that somewhere, some teachers, they are not getting it fully. So, so we'll see what, what happens in the future here, but we, we will move forward pretty fast. That's what we think. Maria, do you have something to add? Well, well, we can't unlearn what they've learned during this uh, period. Um, but we know we know that a lot of teachers they they long to to meet their students in person. So so they they are trying to find ways to to get that sense of belonging in their classroom without, I mean, but still not meeting them, but getting that sense of belonging. And that is a challenge. And I think that is the that is something that is evident everywhere uh, globally that you can't get the connection through Zoom and so on. So the challenge uh, in, in our future sessions is to, to work with that. And then and it's a lot about interactivity as Jenny said before. So uh, yeah, that is it. <laughs> yes, it, the one more thing that happens to us is that we need to step up with the technical parts they the systems they need to talk to each other before i mean they liked to do the to uh, integrate systems but today they kind of demand that it should be integrated and that uh, yeah we need to step up there really Thanks, Jenny Maria. And just maybe a quick uh, follow up question on that. Uh, would you say it's been very functionally led or do you think, I mean, you were talking a lot about digital ecosystem and integrated tools. Uh, is that a, something that you feel is at, at your level or do you feel that is something that needs to come from a strategic level? Uh, could you maybe unpack or share a little bit more there in terms of maybe how you did it or how you felt um, empowered to do it? Just, just something that Lund University is a very heterogeneous environment. Uh, it's almost like eight universities in one department. So all top-down initiatives has always been a problem. But the Canvas project, when we started two years ago, was extremely positive. So the whole university was so tired about having about 18 learning platforms and nowhere to, to go. So when we closed down in March, uh, we, we uh, the Canvas project, that is me and Jenny and our coordinators out on the different faculties, got a sort of collaborative uh, uh, task to, to assemble everything so that the, the teachers and also in some way the students could have one way in because uh, they don't know where to phone or to get support. Mm. I mean, the first thing we got is, hello, have I reached the Canvas support? We said, yes. And they said, so I want to know why it's not working in Zoom. So, so you see, we have, to, we have to really make it easy for, for our teachers to, to find a way to, to learning about, to get support, to get training, to get how to do things, your, your new teaching strategies in that new, new platform and where to ask the questions. And we will start a new big project from January, which actually the principal has ordered. It's about learning digital environments and to, to fix this problem with the support, inspiration and the training. So, yeah. Fantastic. And I think um, a theme from that, for me at least, is around empathy as well, in terms of making sure that the end users, uh, you, you understand their journey as well, in terms of where, where they will run into problems, the, the common mistakes that they might make as well, and kind of help them through that as well. So thank you very much for your contributions. Uh, any of the panelists would like to speak to that? I didn't see any questions in the chat. Um, but uh, I can maybe ask our panelists uh, if anybody else would like to maybe speak to that um, in terms of their experience as well, uh, commonalities, etc. Okay, uh, and there was nothing in the chat either. So thank you, Jenny Maria. We'll sure to call on you again uh, in the next part. Thank you. 
Right, and here we'll hear from uh, Subhanu Saxena. Uh, and uh, if you don't mind, I can pose the question to you and I hope you can all see my screen. Uh, so the question for you, Subhanu, is what impact will the enhanced role of digital learning platforms have on community care health workers? So of course, something that's very topical and you know, uh, workers that we all will rely on and do rely on uh, to get the right information at, on a timely manner. So if I could open the floor up to you uh, to share your experiences, please. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here today with you all. Uh, clearly, this is a year uh, that's been unprecedented in our, our recent times. Uh, and uh, amongst the many challenges and opportunities, I think there have been a few important learnings for us, particularly those of us involved in delivering healthcare. First is, is how we can use disruptive technologies to bring knowledge and healthcare solutions closer to individuals. Uh, and then the second is, what is the army that will do that for us? Well, the first army, I, I just want to highlight, I think we'll look back at this time and see it as probably the single largest global scientific collaboration across the planet that we've see, ever seen. And there are countless numbers of heroes, scientists, healthcare workers, uh, practitioners who have uh, really kind of come together um, to within 12 months of the COVID uh, virus being identified, coronavirus, we have a vaccine. The first patient was vaccinated in the UK yesterday. Uh, if you go back to previous pandemics or outbreaks, it could take years for treatments and vaccines to come forward. So everyone has worked to retool, re-engineer how we bring new innovations uh, to the market. The second is um, the importance of those on the front line who are delivering healthcare uh, services and knowledge. And on the African continent in particular, the community healthcare workers uh, uh, have been highlighted and are now confirmed to play an even more central role in bringing new therapies and, and education to, um, uh, to people across the continent. Uh, and how can we better equip them, empower them uh, to do this at a time when, uh, even though new innovations are coming, uh, there's hesitancy, there's vaccine hesitancy, skepticism about some treatments being used, not just for COVID, but in other areas. Uh, I'll give you the example. Uh, there was a survey done recently by Ipsos, which asked the question across many countries, if a vaccine for COVID-19 were available, would you get it? Uh, the responses varied at the very low end. Uh, France uh, is about 55% of the population, 55-60% uh, would say would absolutely get it. So 40% are not sure whether they would take it. To the other end, I have to say it's India, where about 88% of the population uh, said we would get the vaccine. If you're interested, South Africa, uh, the data was roughly two-thirds of people said we would get the vaccine, pretty much in line with the U.S., uh, which means, still means that one third of people are skeptical about whether they would take uh, a, a vaccine for COVID that would help us get to herd immunity, which is over 85, 90% when people are protected. Uh, it protects the society. So then we start thinking, how can we help um, educate individuals uh, and equip uh, those at the front line with the information they need to move this forward. And, and I think one of the other big learnings this year is the role of truly disruptive new partnerships. So one we've been engaged on at the foundation is with the pharmaceutical industry who have a lot of experience in medical education and companies like Last, Last Mile Health and Living Goods to come together to start creating curricula, training programs, online programs, digital learning platforms, so we can better bring education uh, to healthcare workers so they can have the right discussions across a, a range of fields, not just coronavirus, but uh, uh, maternal child health, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. Uh, and you know, the big realization is whilst many talk about the quantity of healthcare workers we need, maybe up to a million on the African subcontinent, the quality also is going to be important. And here I think uh, novel partnerships, uh, the use of uh, technology platforms, digital platforms, can play a massive role. We have one example uh, of that, how it's combined with healthcare delivery. Um, so the, found, the Gates Foundation partnered in 2016 with a company called Babylon Healthcare, 
who, who signed a 10-year partnership this March in, um, in Rwanda to bring their artificial intelligence platform, a digital doctor, to people. Um, they are approved on the National Health Service here in the UK. Uh, but in Rwanda, uh, they signed this in March. And up to that point, over 2 million people had, had signed on uh, to, 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 to the Babel platform. Uh, roughly 30% of adults have accessed it at some point in time. Uh, and um, they're doing about two and a half to 3,000 virtual consults every day. Uh, and, and so being able to bring treatment uh, and knowledge and education uh, into people's homes uh, for a vast majority of common conditions uh, and then being able to identify when you need to go and see a, a doctor where it appears to be something more complicated or do a video call uh, with a doctor. So I think we have uh, just uh, a wealth of uh, technologies and approaches available. I don't think we need to invent anything new. It's all there, but it's how we put it together and how we form these novel partnerships to make that happen. One final example I'll quickly give. Uh, so we've been working with a company called Lumira, who's rolling out a point of care diagnostics platform initially for, for COVID detection. Uh, and that rollout was happening in, in South Africa, I believe, as we speak, uh, where essentially uh, it takes a, a, um, a, a digital lab in, in, a, in a, a box, a point of care unit that can sit away from a hospital to start, therefore, bringing healthcare services into the field, closer to people, uh, you tie that with what role community healthcare workers can play, and you start building a very different ecosystem uh, where the doctor, the knowledge, and the services are brought to the individual versus having individuals either cover vast distances or go to hospitals where there are high risks of infections, etc. I think the real priority right now is clearly on the vaccine side, uh, as we now have uh, uh, vaccine solutions emerging. How do we use a technology platforms, digital platforms to, to increase awareness, education, uh, and, and the, the, the benefit that vaccines can bring uh, and, uh, and try and get us through this, this time and back to uh, the new normal. I don't think we'll ever go back to how things were. Uh, we, you know, we will fundamentally change how we interact with each other. I fully uh, resonate with the previous comment that was made by Jenny and Maria that we still need the human connection, and that's the conundrum we still need to fix. Uh, it's wonderful connecting here on video, but I'd love to be in a room with you all. So I think those are still challenges and opportunities ahead of us. So um, I'm looking forward to the discussion and chat today uh, as we go through the session. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. And really great to hear some of the work that you guys are doing there as well. Uh, some of the points that you spoke about was collaboration, coming together, and disruptive partnerships as well. If I could maybe ask you around that disruptive partnership, uh, do you think those are kind of happy accidents that happen, or are you kind of more talking about being deliberate and strategic about finding partners in maybe other industries or other areas yeah. uh, for collaboration? If I could maybe ask you to, to share a little bit more there as well, please. Sure, that's a great question. I think there have been some very um, happy accident partnerships forming, but that has sparked, I think, a, a desire to be much more uh, systematic of seeking out new partnerships, new ways of connecting, uh, and, and you know, working across uh, industry groups. Um, how can we engage with uh, fast-moving consumer goods companies on the continent? Uh, who have some understanding of behavioral insights of people and have a distribution reach, uh, that those are maybe partnerships we should explore more, or more systematically. Partnerships between government, public sector, and private sector. I, I think, you know, we're certainly trying to think about how, how could we, do we be a forum uh, uh, to, to, to bring together different groups who can then partner up and then move forward. And if we can be a catalyst, great. If they can do it without us, then that's, that's even better. So uh, I think it takes a bit of thought and uh, certainly one has to open the mind uh, as to uh, the art of the possible. And one thing I often say to people is in any project or discussion, put the constraint at the end. We often very quickly say, oh, that can't be done for that reason or that reason. And we just constrain our thinking too early. If we just open our hearts and minds a little as we move through difficult problems, I think it may come up with uh, innovative approaches and innovative uh, partners we can work with to achieve those results. Yeah, fantastic. 
and I, I really like that with the constraint at the end. I think that's that's a that's a very nice way to spin things as well. Uh, I see we have a discussion uh, from um, I believe it's Louis who had a hand up. So uh, maybe if I can call upon Louis to 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 speak to uh, speak to that point or contribute, please. Yes, thanks, uh, you and I was more interested in asking a little bit uh, different question on this. Uh, because we are talking about uh, community care health workers and uh, from our perspective where we are also doing training of uh, nurses and dentists and so on um, i'm interested to ask uh, what uh, what uh, he thinks the the effect uh, is on the quality of the training uh, because we are doing a lot of these virtually and sometimes with simulations but uh, will that have a, a a lasting effect on, on the training of our students uh, that need uh, some practical work. So uh, maybe something on that. Louis, that's a, that's a great question. Maybe I can um, give a couple of initial uh, thoughts on that and see if uh, Jenny or Maria have any comments to add. So uh, I think we are very used to a certain learning and training mod model uh, and it, you're absolutely right. You cannot beat hands-on experience. Uh, so I think we, particularly those who are involved in delivering healthcare, uh, we can't get away from that. So how how do we protect individuals who are in that situation so they get some of that experience? But I, I have to say I've been quite impressed with the pace of 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 a development of some of the online pedagogical tools. Um, uh, in, in terms of what they were able to to do to impart at least the theory. Uh, I think one of the key things there is it has to be uh, sustained. So one-off, it was not going to work. You have to build a curriculum. So the Healthcare Worker Academy program is going to be a multi-year program and a combination of online plus in-person kind of uh, uh, activities. Uh, so I think, you know, there whether it's through advent of vaccines or, or, or just the um, protective equipment, we, we still need to find ways that people can get that hands-on experience. Because um, I think simulations get us so far, but uh, um, we're humans that need human connection after all at some point. And so I think that's why the importance of, particularly now, building herd immunity to allow us to get back to... to safely being able to have more of those interactions. But I don't know if Maria or, or, or Jenny wanted to add anything from your experience of, of uh, digital learning in, in Sweden. Yes, uh, well, I, I wanted to comment on, on the competitive space uh, that you asked about, because it's such an interesting question, because in Sweden, our universities are free. Uh, is it the same in South Africa and and the others, there's no there's no cost to to join a university, uh, so so we don't have to fight uh, for for student in that way. But uh, Lund Universities is one of those very old, uh, not glorious, but I don't know what to say. But it, one of those old uh, uh, on the fall universities, so to say, uh, and um, has always. Uh, one on being a, a campus university. So the students will come anyway, even though we're not at the front uh, in technology. But I think that is, that is going to change because now we have smaller universities that are much more in the front line because they have a top-down strategy or they have a strategy at all and, and have, to, have to be on that edge. So I think I think it's important to, to try to be in the front, but I also think it's, it's a good thing to do that together with the universities. I hope it will not come to that factor that we have uh, a direct competition, but we can collaborate on the important questions, even though uh, we have, we have uh, different perspectives and that we need to take one more step forward. Like Jenny said before, we have to, we have to work on the competence on, on the whole university, uh, all employees and all the teachers as well. 
Yeah, no, great question. And, and thanks, Dr. Seal, for prompting that as well. Uh, what I've seen as well, uh, a lot of times when we engage with universities, um, they actually surprise you. So just yesterday, I made an introduction to three uh, private business schools who compete against each other. One is a current customer of ours, and the other two had asked to, to meet and engage with the, the third. Uh, very quickly, it was set up, and they were willing to share best practice and talk about their approach and speak to the wise as well. So I, I think there is the same safe space that we can find. Uh, I think each university will find their own competitive advantage, whether it's an R1 or if they focus on technology as well. So that's definitely kind of what I've seen uh, from, from a vendor perspective as well. But maybe I can call on Baz here as well, who's done a lot of work in Europe and, and worked with, with other institutions, uh, if he has something else to, to add in terms of, of that uh, from a competitive uh, participant point of view. Yeah, happy to you, and and, uh, and thanks everybody for uh, for your contribution so far. Uh, so yeah, I, I think it's still a collaborative, very collaborative market, uh, even in countries where competition is high uh, for students uh, or for rankings like the UK or the US. There's a tremendous amount of sharing. Um, it's and you know people really see the the tools and the processes not as what distinguishes themselves, but it's uh, it's all about the, the student experience and the. The human interaction and obviously the the network and quality especially these days of the alumni network that uh, students are looking for uh, so i i have yet in my 20-year career uh, to find an institution that declined uh, a reference call or a question like hey we're we're thinking about implementing this technology stack can you let me know what kind of resources you have what skill sets they have uh, so so far they've been uh, they've been very collaborative and i i see that going actually uh, more, um, I would see that more intensified as institutions also realize that they, they can't be the best at everything. Uh, and that it's, it's really uh, about being one voice also back to the governments uh, and uh, under funders of the institution to, uh, to see how they can do things uh, jointly. Because now I think in the Nordics, uh, maybe by that lack of competition for students and student fees, uh, you, you've done a number of great collaborative things. For instance, the student system in Sweden is the same for all the universities. It's uh, it's government supplied. Uh, universities uh, obviously have the knowledge how to integrate and work with it, but uh, there's no uh, SIS competition, if you will, uh, because the government says, hey, this is this is basically a sunk cost, it's technology that we need. And, and if we have one platform, it makes some things at a government level also easier in terms of tracking transcripts and uh, doing clearance for university places, et cetera. So I, I actually see more collaboration, uh, not less. Fantastic, thanks Baz for sharing that. We've got one more question from the floor, it's from Beauty and she, and this is probably directed a bit more to Jenny and Maria and maybe Miku can come in as well. So she's very interested to know how other universities handle the issue of practicals using technology. So quite a specific question, but I'm not sure if maybe Jenny and Maria can speak from their perspective and I think Miku can maybe uh, ground us and, and maybe even Louis can ground us from a South African perspective what they've seen has been working or what people are doing. So if we could maybe open that question to the panel as well, please. Uh, other universities in Sweden, then is the question just to- so I, I think I think she, I think that Beauty, it might be, uh, she might be taking a South African perspective. So what other universities in South Africa are doing? So maybe- All right, then it's not a question for me then. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe I wouldn't could, know. <laughs> <laughs> to jump in. So I think maybe if you if you had something in the back pocket about what you guys are doing uh, around practicals and technology, I think that would help. Um, but Niku, I'm not sure if that's something that uh, you feel. I, you I can quickly touch on that. It's it's actually a, a very program specific question to answer. If you look at the health um, health education fields, nursing, etc., it pretty much will work exactly the same as it would with an online uh, student because. If there's a practical component where they need to go to uh, to a um, to a clinic or do practical at a hospital, um, that that pretty much is where you have to go to do that because you do need practical experience, and um, uh, it, the same process will be followed. For example, in education, um, if there are practical uh, classes that need to be presented and evaluated, it will also be pretty much the same. Uh, lab work, there are many, many virtual labs available um, online. 
uh, also a huge cost saving, of course, for universities, if you have really expensive chemicals and things that are usually used in the labs, um, students can um, use these virtual labs to um, combine certain elements and see the reactions. Um, but as I say, it's very, it's very program specific and also it will depend on whether your, your student base is South African based or if the program is across regions. I mean, uh, if you think about practical experience for uh, something like a business type program, um, many of those um, students will be in, 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 in business already and uh, their practical experience will be applied as they move through the program. And a lot of times we see there where they then have a type of a journal that they keep as to what they do practically or how they apply the new knowledge that they have acquired. So yeah, as I say, it's very, it's very um, program specific and it's a very large discussion actually to have and explore. Thanks Nico for wading into that one as well. Uh, Louis, I noticed that your mic was open. Did you want to comment yes. on that? Oh, thank you. Yes, Ewan, uh, I can also uh, link to that and say that, yes, it's certainly program specific, as Nico said. Uh, I assisted uh, the University of the Western Cape uh, with uh, their online program during this time. And uh, it was especially the students uh, uh, that had no access that was really a problematic and especially those with uh, lab work to be completed. And that includes uh, PhDs and masters that had experiments running uh, in science and they need to complete it. And then also the dentistry students uh, at the University of the Western Cape had uh, to come back to campus. But what happened is in the first uh, uh, few weeks uh, and months, it was uh, almost everything was virtual and uh, simulations, uh, a very, very creative work done in that regard. Um, and only later these students were brought back to, to campus, not all students, but only a few selected students together with those who didn't have uh, access that we can talk about later at all. But it, uh, it was a difficult situation and of course with strict protocols. Uh, we also established uh, there a virtual uh, reality center that was uh, that uh, there was a donor, and uh, then it was a, a little bit easier to 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 have uh, really complex simulations for nursing and some of the other uh, disciplines. So, uh, but it's uh, it was very program specific uh, in this regard. Thank you uh, both for answering their beauty. I hope that was um, in part spoke to your question there as well. Thanks so, so much for all the questions and thanks for the engagement so far from the panelists. Uh, long may it continue. So uh, we'll move on to the next slide, if that's okay. And I'll call upon uh, Baz Ten Halter. And the question here is reflecting on the pandemic's effect on teaching this year, what have you heard from practitioners that with hindsight, and if they were given time to prepare for it, what are the, some of the aspects or responses that they said they would have wanted to do or repeat? Yeah, Yun, thank, thank you so much. And this is uh, this is one obviously that uh, we're dealing with uh, all the time. Um, you, you talked earlier about a, a happy accident. Um, are things uh, you know happening by by design? I, I do believe that institutions that had already a vision to be more flexible, more student centered uh, in their approach, um, have done uh, what they could to uh, address the effects. But also, they've had more of the mindset to. To sort of put uh, the student in the center and uh, and, and treat them like uh, the the individual that has uh, obviously education requirements, uh, job aspirations, uh, or community uh, community service uh, elements to to their desire. So I think what uh, what we've seen from practitioners is the um, the need to actually uh, have one version of the truth uh, so that they. Uh, act as one uh, institution. And, and that is often very, very difficult in organizations that have academic freedom in faculties, maybe different systems, different websites, different landing zones, different approaches to uh, open days. But um, we, we have seen a lot of them uh, come back and say, well, uh, we, we could have done a lot better if we were already 
acting as one institution, if you will, so that uh, the students that uh, would come to us and ask for help or just ask for information, right? Is the is the campus open? We're hearing this and that on the news. Uh, can we come? Uh, you're saying you're opening for 10%. What 10% is that? Is that just the freshers or is that the people who have more practicals? Uh, so that that over communication would be a lot easier if you had one uh, one source of that student data and one one version of the truth uh, in sense. Uh, so that that's been a continuing uh, comment coming back. And now, obviously, with the learnings of the last nine months, uh, what institutions that uh, that see now that we've been hit by a pandemic that say this this won't be the last um, disruption. And uh, the perspective that I always try to bring, especially here in Western Europe, is that. Uh, there have been disruptions in academic practice in uh, many forms in many countries, you know, all the way from uh, weather conditions in Scandinavia to availability of electricity or civil unrest in Asia. Uh, so uh, you, you have to prepare almost as an institution for uh, this, this being able to turn on a dime reality where you could either by the government be told to close or by some other uh, outside uncontrollable influencer. Uh, and then you'd better have your student advising, uh, your recruiting, your alumni engagement, your open days uh, virtual. Uh, so I think that's the that's the main aspect that uh, people have have come back on. Oh, fantastic, Baz, and I mean, uh, good to hear as well. Um, some of that. I mean, I did change management um, uh, as well, part of my master's degree, and there, uh, where well, you were talking about one version of the truth and and communication as well. I think those were kind of key pillars of any change management program being able to deliver a ride through it as well, to be able to kind of have a common language about how we're talking about a change. And I think there are some challenges that universities do face when there are multiple versions of the truth. Uh, but maybe Niku, I know you engaged uh, across Africa and further afield as well and work with a lot of institutions as well. Uh, any thoughts uh, to complement onto that as well? Yeah, I, I, I really agree with what he said. It's a mindset. It is absolutely a mindset. And um, yes, I'm also so convinced, and, and I'll, I'll mention it later again, that this is probably the first pandemic. Um, and I'm always worried that as soon as the pandemic passes, um, we all move back into a comfort zone and we go back to business as usual. And then we forget about the, the fact that we've actually learned that a lot of things don't need to be um, the way it was for the past hundred years. And um, I'm just thinking about this whole process of embracing the changes and changing the mindsets of those who are set in the way they do things. So um, I've seen it across the globally in all our regions um, that um, this pandemic has caused uh, this emergency teaching perspective to come to the front. And uh, everybody believes that that is now online learning, but it isn't. Um, it is just moving from the classroom online, not planning properly, not really thinking through everything properly. And it will, will, will take a strong um, change management process to get things um, where they should be. I hope that, that addresses what, what you, you asked. <laughs> Thanks, Niku. I really appreciate the, the, the continued conversation. I think there's a hand up from uh, Maria. So if I could maybe open the floor for you, Maria, to, to comment from a practitioner point of view. Yes, I, would, I just wanted to comment and agree on that. Uh, our management were so happy when we actually we managed to, to do spring and summer. But as uh, Nico said before, and also Bess, there's a huge difference between teaching and learning online and emergency teaching online. And we are concerned about the teachers not understanding that difference, the ones that are not within distance learning and so on. And that's what Jenny was also talking about before, the quality of the courses has to, we've, we've moved in, so the digital competence is, is raised, but we have to have to enhance the courses so that it's actually is interactive learning environments that we're seeing online, because as Beth said before, uh, perhaps we need to turn on a dime and we have to do that directly even after the new normal has uh, come in again. 
Thanks, Maria. Sorry, I'm just monitoring the chat at the same time. And I think there's a, a question probably for Louis. Uh, the question is, where can one learn and explore more in the virtual reality center? And I think that was part of, 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 of a, a conversation piece that you spoke to, Louis. So um, I'm not sure if you just want to speak to it quickly or for, uh, answer that in the chat. Yes, I can. You and I can just quickly answer that. It's, uh, it's uh, relatively new, so it's not widely advertised. It had to kick in uh, because of the emergency teaching, uh, online teaching. And so uh, there will be information much later um, uh, about the research that will be done and what will be happening and programs and so forth. So it is, at the moment, uh, it's not widely advertised yet because it's not totally ready. Uh, in its in its entirety, so uh, there will be on the on the website more information later of uh, the University of the Western Cape UWC. Uh, .ac .z if you need to have a look. Fantastic, thanks, Louis. Um, and then I see uh, Rassi. I think you had a hand up as well. So. <laughs> yeah, even from my side to all of the panelists. Um, in the answers that they've given thus far, um, um, maybe they can allude to, to, to the role that, that um, data and analytics, analyzing the data in the right way has played in terms of the reaction or response to the, that the pandemic might have had on the teaching and learning and the strategic planning of the universities and so on. Um, I don't know whether it played a, a role, but I believe data and the way that we work with data and the importance of data to inform us to react in the in the more appropriate way that should have played a, a major role. So, yeah, a question from my from my my side to to all the panelists. Maybe anyone anyone uh, then can answer. Fantastic. Thanks, Rassi, and good question. So uh, I can maybe leave it sit there and see who's going to be brave enough to, to fast his finger first. I think it'll be Baz. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, no, it, and obviously paramount importance. And uh, we, we've seen this uh, with institutions that, uh, that have struggled with that question of, of uh, do we reopen? How do we reopen? And, uh, and what information do we have? Um, initially, the focus was very much on the students and making sure that the students would uh, would be able to travel from overseas. Uh, in, in the case of, for instance, the London School of Economics, they had a, a huge reliance on the on their summer programs. Uh, lots of uh, you know inner London real estate uh, housing to give people a fantastic experience. But all of a sudden, obviously, you know visas, uh, travel, everything is impacted. Um, but then they they quickly uh, change to uh, staff members uh, because it's one thing to have you know very healthy 18 to 24 year olds, but they'll be in front of people that uh, we've seen now with the data we have uh, are more to target uh, risk areas of people with underlying conditions uh, of a higher age group, etc. And, and a lot of their professors uh, would be that. So. So what they tried to combine is actually the data about uh, wellness, well-being, uh, based on surveys, but also based on uh, on contact tracing of uh, their uh, their teachers uh, and other administrative uh, staff, as well as the students. Uh, and then with that data, they were then able to to take informed decisions on uh, which are the courses we're going to proceed with, uh, which will be the hybrid ones or or even the online ones, uh, which uh, faculties. Um, based on you know the the visa complications the uh, the unrest obviously from people having to travel as well as uh, the you know the mindset and, uh, and health risks of the faculty uh, are they going to uh, continue with and uh, the, the dutch government has has always said we need to take 100 percent of decisions with 50 percent of the information uh, and yeah the more information you have about um, what people's uh, not just what their practical uh, complications are, but also their mindset in, in you know how they are ready to expose themselves, be in classrooms, uh, and, and you know and, and how that affects their mental well-being uh, has been a huge important element to that. So the more you can you know increase that 50% of the data to you'll never get 100%, but at least to to have some radar as you're flying through the mist uh, on how the institution should uh, should reopen. And, and if you get it wrong, um, you, you've seen what happens. Um, you know, there have been uh, strikes of student unions. There have been people asking for rent debates. There have been teacher unions that are concerned about being, quote unquote, chased back to campus for commercial reasons. 
so a lot of that comes from uh, either not having the data uh, and not informing and over communicating with people with uh, with one voice. Uh, so yeah, in, important importance of data absolutely, uh, and more and more uh, is is available. But you need to somehow structure it, and, and starting with the wellness and well being of of staff and students is a, is a great place uh, because then also your tone of voice strikes the right chord, right? So you're uh, you're, you're not in accused as we've seen in, in widely uh, advertised articles of uh, them trying to get students through the door until such time that they have to um, you know forfeit their deposit almost i mean that that's not the way that you want to be remembered as an institution right you want to be a, a caring alma mater where people give back for life um, and, uh, and and they'll remember uh, how you acted in this period that's a great answer, Baz. And Rossi, are you happy with that? Or would you like to uh, uh, do a back and forth Perry a little bit more there? <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. Thanks, thanks, um, Baz. Um, while, while I have the mic, um, uh, even there's questions posted in the question and answers. So uh, a question from Oliver, um, maybe uh, to the panelists of Sweden first, but then all of the panelists might, might uh, want to come in. Um, Oliver's question, how do we pursue common or shared technology platforms in universities like in Sweden was directed by government and what were the lessons learned? And Oliver asked, uh, please, let's, let's look at the lessons from South Africa. And then a related question from William that says, at Lund and other institutions, how was the line management responsibilities dealt with? For example, performance appraisals of staff. So the, yeah, the two questions do um, seems as if it's the panelists from Sweden, and if the other panelists want to add to that, please. So uh, I, I'm going to read the first question again. How do we pursue common or shared technology platforms in universities like in Sweden, that where it was directed by government, and what were the lessons learned? And let's talk about South Africa, please. That was the first question from Oliver. Mm. Uh, so I think the, uh, Jenny and Maria might have internet connectivity uh, issues. So maybe if we can put the focus on on some of the other panelists. <laughs> uh, I, I think she's asking if you could maybe rephrase the question. Sorry, uh, sorry, um, uh, Rossi. Can you ask that again, please? Sorry. Okay, I'll read it again. So how do we pursue common or shared technology platforms in universities? Like what happened in Sweden, where this was directed by government. And what were the lessons learned when we, when you pursued this common or shared technology platforms? And then Oliver asks that um, if possible for the South African panelists also to, to, to comment on this. And I think uh, Maria there, that might be in reference to uh, SUNET uh, agreement in terms of uh, oh, services, okay. as okay. well as the SALSA like, network. So oh, I'm not understanding this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so so uh, we're not sharing in that in that way really. But what we do have is an organization called SUNET. It's the Swedish University Computer Network that delivers infrastructure at, uh, in Sweden. And so what they do is they also uh, you can also buy the services like Canvas and Zoom and Kaltura, for instance, from that network. So, so what we have done around those then sheds, for instance, we have uh, 26 institutions using uh, Canvas and uh, I don't know how many using Zoom or Kaltura, but it's in that size uh, that we have the, these uh, more or less informal networks that we're working uh, collaborative around and, and we in these networks, for instance, the Salsa network with it, which is Canvas, we uh, collaborate around guides, but also legislation. Uh, there's a lot of questions in, in Sweden on what can you do on your examinations? Is it okay to, to uh, use Zoom to, to watch over the students? Uh, so, so questions like that has been discussed, but also different technology questions. What kind of integrations have you done at your institution and so on? So there's a collaboration uh, across the borders that has given uh, a lot of university. I mean, it's it's really great to have that possibility to 
to exchange experience and learn to each other. But we had that long before the pandemic, actually. Uh, was that answer or, or please rephrase it if I didn't answer correctly, I'm, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> I think that was kind of the shape of the question, I'm not okay, sure. Okay, good. Yeah, and while while you while you have the mic, uh, Maria William uh, Daniels asks um, at Lund and other institutions, how was the line management responsibilities dealt with in terms of performance appraisals, etc. And with line management, you mean our principal and so on. What kind of rule did they have? Yeah, when they when they would appraise the performance of staff. Because of the of oh okay mm -hmm. uh, the appraised the performance of the staff uh, well when it comes to technology I'm not sure that you actually do that at all that is one of the questions we have discussed who is actually responsible for the quality and structure of the different courses. Uh, because we don't have anyone that is really responsible. So what we do is we do service at the end of the courses where the students get to, to uh, uh, explain how they felt about the course and so on, if they learned and if they reached the learning outcomes. But where it, when it comes to the teacher performance with technology, um, I, I'm guessing that they, they, they don't have the question battery, but, but it is coming. I'm thinking that they are getting much more feedback now after the pandemic that they, than they got before. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, I hope that answers that question. Anybody else would like to speak to that from the panel or are we okay to move on to the next, uh, next session? Well, one, one comment I would make, uh, Ewan, and, and this is from a conversation I've just had actually this morning with uh, with an institution in South Africa who informed me about uh, the economic hardship uh, caused by the pandemic and uh, the budget uh, cut to universities uh, that is that is pending. Um, and what we, we we've seen this before in, in other governments where um, it yeah it's a tough time because you actually have a higher need for reskilling, retraining and flexible universities. And at the same time, the ability of governments to spend on it uh, is uh, is limited. Uh, and this is where sort of, you know, the ultimate shared service centers uh, really have a role to play. And I think if you look at the examples uh, from Sweden uh, and how this came about, uh, the very early examples were always the networking, right? So universities have researchers, researchers share lots of data, they need to collaborate, so they want to be connected. So those data lines were there and, and hence the, the names of those organizations, they usually have net somewhere in it. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have Super Janet in the UK, you have Sunet, uh, Uninet it used to be called in Norway. Uh, you have the SurfNet in the Netherlands. Uh, there's many others like that. And then those organizations have started to build up uh, services on top of that, like sometimes very simple uh, like storage, uh, but sometimes more advanced around identity management or even nationwide SIS systems. And uh, a, a conversation that you can have as a sector with your government is instead to say, yeah, let's punish everybody uh, by just cutting 10% uh, um, off, off the top and you figure out how you do it, is to start thinking about how much money uh, every institution sh spends on some of these uh, rudimentary services like storage, like connectivity, like wireless, uh, like identity management and like student information systems, which are largely built to to satisfy the government's information need and see where where you can have some savings there and still allow institutions to obviously you know buy buy and select what's necessary for their particular operations that are more teaching and learning uh, but see if you can uh, consolidate some of that back office spend and uh, and find your savings there as opposed to just saying we're going to cut the um, the invoice to the universities by uh, a, a significant amount A great comment, Baz. Thanks for that. Uh, definitely good insights and definitely something we've seen in, in Scandinavia and in, in pockets of, of Europe as well, where they've looked to, to those types of economies and, and I suppose those, those types of setups as well. Uh, Rassi, sorry, I said we were going to move on to the next session. I'm just cognizant of the fact that we just gone past halfway point. Uh, was there another question from the Q&A? Um, or are we okay to move on? I know there was some chat and Louis will answer some of the questions around connectivity in his session. Are we okay to move on to Niku now? 
Uh, or is there one more question that you felt we should uh, lift up? No, there's all the questions answered. Thank you. Thanks, Rasi. Appreciate it. Right, Niku, uh, the longest question of the day so far. <laughs> so expecting an extremely interesting answer here, but uh, here we go. Niku. Longest one. <laughs> this one's for you. In the minds of educators and students, the physical campuses and contact-based attendance has traditionally outranked the online learning experience. Do you think COVID has proven that the campus can be reinstituted as more than just a location and the opportunity to spread university capability and, flu and influence, excuse me, has has opened. Uh, so I think we've touched on some of these, but great to get your thoughts on this one and in a more formal process um, and, and answer here. Thanks, Niku. Um, well, there's a lot to touch on in that question um, or a series of questions or statements. Um, there are also so many opinions about, um, about this. And from a personal perspective, I would say yes, absolutely. Learning can and should be, in my opinion, 100% online. Um, it is possible, it should not be limited to the number of chairs you can fit into a room. Um, uh, the size of the room will determine how many students will be able to study, and that doesn't seem right to me. Uh, I think the pandemic just really helped. Um, and we, to be honest, we should have been prepared um, for many years already. I, I remember many years ago, um, you know, when e-learning started, the e-learning units would always try their best to get everybody to either be fully online or have a blended component. And most of the time, the LMS that was, um, was used was usually used as a very expensive USB stick or a file distribution system, um, or, you know, uploading PDFs. And we never really got there to implement it properly. Luckily, and it sounds terrible, but luckily we've had a pandemic to show us the way. And um, I'm not saying it's a good thing to have a pandemic. I'm just saying the pandemic uh, really, really helped us um, see, see the light. Um, I frantically, I was searching for a quote just now, and I found it luckily. Um, Stephen Bounds is a very good friend and a thought leader in education. And um, he recently, like in the past week, um, wrote a post where he said, um, we need, well, I, I, I changed it a bit, but we need to stop thinking of school or university as a place and start thinking of it as an activity. We should set meaningful learning goals adapted to support the many needs of our diverse communities. Our educators should trans, uh, transition from in-person content presenters to learning support specialists. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of truth in there. He was kind of looking back from the year 2030 when we've had in, in this scenario already had a few pandemics and he, he wrote a beautiful post, a very informal and I picked up a typing error that I will email him about. And I, I really hope that uh, if you don't know him, Stephen Downs really follow some of his, um, his posts and also listen to many of his his presentations. He was in the country a few years ago um, at a few conferences. So, so our time to that about, uh, well, in 2020, 2004, I presented a paper at a conference, um, actually, I think in Pots of Sturm, Nadia Hosa. And there I presented a paper that said, well, I called it the end of the traditional university. And uh, a lot of people joined it because they were or uh, kind of upset already when they walked in, because I said in my paper that many of the offices in or the classrooms will be converted to instructional designer uh, hubs, video labs, uh, IT uh, venues, servers, things like that. And um, yes, 2004, it was really not the topic to, to even touch on because everybody was dead set against losing face to face. And yes, I may have said in the presentation that it would happen within five to 10 years. I didn't know that we would need a pandemic. Um, and um, I'm sure that when during coffee time, when all of those people came up to me telling me how wrong I was, I wish I had their names now, because if we prepared 16 years ago, um, we would be ready for, for these things. So in answering the part of the question that uh, is about outranking online learning, uh, being outranked 
by on campus. I I have not seen that. I I I think we we may be um, almost thinking in a way that we believe it to be, rather than the way that we have seen it play out. Um, if you look at the large dropout rates or the high dropout rates on campus for students first year, second year, third year, in the end, it's like, I can't remember the number, but let's say 20% of students graduate. And, and I may be wrong, please don't quote me. But there's a lot of dropouts. In, in, in our company, when we work with our students, we always focus on the student success and the retention rates. So whatever we do, we, we really focus on keeping the student um, in, the, in, in, in the learning process, ensuring a great student journey, um, putting in place proper student retention services. And just to mention, uh, that is also where we use a lot of analytics and data uh, just to ensure that students um, uh, get a great learning experience. And how you do that is to properly plan your online courses. And if you properly plan a course online, and let's, let's be honest, it's not done always on campus, but you ensure alignment, you ensure that the outcomes are addressed and that you focus on the outcomes in your assessments, your activities, in everything you do, your students will be successful. A lot of the time on campus, that is not done. A lecturer often comes into a classroom or they get appointed. They are a specialist in the field. They are brilliant, but they don't necessarily even know what the outcomes are that they need to address. So they're teaching from their experience. They're sharing great ideas, keeping the students busy for that hour because that's the class time. But they never delve into really examining the alignment of, for example, the outcomes of each module. Are they aligned to the outcomes of the program? Do they talk to each other? Uh, the, all the activities, as I said just now, are they aligned to the objectives of achieving those objectives or outcomes? And also, during this whole process of, 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 of development and design, you must always focus and ensure that there's a proper student journey, that th there's a progression through the learning, that the students are engaged, that you, um, you, you provide accessibility for students with disabilities. I mean, just that, just think of that huge market of students that can't go to on campus, but through online learning, you can give them access by providing transcripts, making sure that everything is accessible and, 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 and just works for them. And of course, um, uh, in our case, we, we apply and we are members of the Quality Matters um, uh, of Quality Matters. So we, we align to best practices um, uh, in online learning. So um, we, we're not, we're not, I just, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm skipping a few things because I realized I'm just going on and on now. Um, but when you, when you think of ensuring the success of the students, it's vital not to try and start from scratch. I know all universities in South Africa, all the ID groups I engage with, um, and even globally, the ID teams on campus who were in the past really, they weren't given the opportunity to grow in online because that was not really the focus of the university. They now have ideas of what they want to apply and to ensure the student success and ensure that the students are, 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 are um, managed through the process. They all want to apply their own ideas. I always say, start from uh, by, by engaging with those who have done hundreds of modules online. Engage with international um, universities. Make sure that you don't start from scratch. Partner with someone. Just get it going and do not let the COVID pandemic, uh, I mean, um, the worst enemy of the online programs is probably the vaccine that is being rolled out. We, we, we should not now go back to the way we were. We should focus on the online because in the end, the retention, the success rates of the students will be better because the planning is better. The, the proper putting in place of processes are better than just giving someone a handbook, let them walk into a classroom. And just in, in, in my last thought there is, and we said it before, emergency online teaching is not equal to um, a well-presented, well-designed online course. And in South Africa, uh, 
with the really long accreditation process for online programs, really long, I think the, the most important thing is that all universities should get going now. Get started with accreditation. It's going to take 18 months to get your programs accredited for online or for distance. And we need to get rid of all that red tape internally because the external or the governmental accreditation process may take uh, uh, many years to change. But if you want to ensure that your students actually have a great engagement, great learning opportunities, and, and accessibility to, 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 or access to, to learning, then we need to um, be sure that we, we, we get things going very, very, very quickly. So the best time to start is obviously today. Um, and in a nutshell, I hope um, I didn't go off on too much of a rant, um, but yes, in short, that is my thoughts. Thanks, Nico. And it's always, always nice to hear from you. I think Rassi had one more question that ties into your section, which I think we'll pass to you. And then after that, if we could maybe go to Subhal Numa, I think he wanted to add something to, to your section as well. So uh, if I can maybe pass to Rassi to direct that question to Nico and then uh, Subhal Numa to, to respond as well. Thanks, Ewan. Um, Nico, this is an appropriate question asked by uh, Rumela. Um, if online learning is the way to go, what would you then recommend in terms of um, uh, how to protect cheating and dishonesty by students, which seem to be quite the problem within the online environment? And if you then can speak to this, comment on this, and then talk about the different online systems that's available to protect cheating, dishonesty, and, and so forth. Okay, so there's also uh, a lot of discussion around that uh, each time we engage with universities, and obviously globally. Um, oh, first of all, what I always say is, assessment should be authentic. Assessment should be continuous, con continuous and formative at the same time, or formative, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> continuous summative, um, so that you don't have one major exam at the end where you try and test everything. You should be uh, uh, planning your assessment in a way that will not just test the retention of facts, but rather the application. And, and I mean, that, that's probably been the, the way or things that people say, even for on campus. Um, same applies online. Online does not necessarily need to be completely different. But we do not need to chase all our students into one room for three hours to see what they could remember from what they read 10 minutes before. I, I, I was one of those lucky guys. I've got a really good short-term retention. So um, if I need to get ready for exam, I would just read everything very quickly before the time. And for at least two days, I would retain most of that. Um, and, and that's not the way to test someone. Then um, if, if it's uh, continuous summative, you know, you, you, you're taking care of certain portions. And then at the end, you don't need this huge exam at the end. And speaking to that, yes, of course, um, there will always be cheating. There's cheating on campus. Um, there's, there's cheating all over. I remember when Blackboard, uh, um, well, when we started working with Blackboard back in the day and they had the feature, um, or they just added the feature of randomizing questions. And we used to chase all, all the students into a room and they would sit at their computers and they would get multiple choice. And then we would leave them um, because they on the computers. And um, one day I was walking through and I heard one student tell the other student, 7A. And then I realized, so the student doesn't realize that the sequencing of those questions are different and the answers are also random. So one student may have all the answers right, but all the others listening to him will probably be wrong because the, the sequence isn't the same. The other thing, of course, is to use proctoring services. In South Africa, unfortunately, uh, most of the, the best um, proctoring services are quite expensive. They charge per hour, per student, per test, uh, many different uh, options. I, um, I can't remember the name now. I just had about two, three weeks ago, a demonstration from a, a Spanish um, proctoring service, which actually had great um, pricing. 
um, I, I would even I would share the name with you later, and you can maybe share it with those Thank who are you. interested. But um, they all basically work on the same principle of taking, you know, um, the ambient noise and ensuring that there isn't uh, funny movements, ensuring that the facial features don't change. A lot of it is AI, um, but then of course the expense on the expensive side, you can have someone actually watching the student um, through the webcam. Uh, I, I believe that that if you if you plan your assessments well and you um, you test knowledge rather than just retention, that that um, you can kind of take care of, of that problem. It's not always possible, but um, I think for the most part, you should be able to, to eliminate the cheating ability um, with, with, with just the way that you uh, present a question. But that's my personal opinion. I think a lot of people will disagree. Thanks, Nico. And maybe if we could just open the floor to Sabano, I think he wanted a, a comment on, on, I think, the, your session. Yeah. Uh, Super. No, thanks for that, Evan. Um, and maybe just to build on, on, on what Nico just said, um, my experience growing up was uh, um, having closed and open book exams, when you actually you were allowed to have all the books you wanted in front of you. I'll tell you, we dreaded the open book exams more because they were focusing on knowledge, how you arrived at an answer. Uh, and so I, I do think we actually have some quite old precedents as to how to handle um, remote setting exams uh, from the open book experience that some of us may have had growing up. And I studied sciences at school. So, uh, and then I, I tell you, those were tough exams, and they you really had to show how you thought about stuff. Um, so, so I think uh, uh, just, I just wanted to give a, a slightly offbeat example to this question of how does uh, online learning versus in-person learning, and will one outrank the other? From um, a, a charity that I, I, I work with, um, I must um, first disclose that I have a dark side. I am a scholar of Sanskrit and ancient Indian literature and philosophy and have run, conducted classes in, in Sanskrit and Vedic literature and, and so on over, over the years. And I'm on the executive committee of the Institute of Indian Culture in the UK, the Bharati Vidya Bhavan, or the Bhavan is short, which is the, there to promote the arts and culture of, of India, music, dance, uh, language. And you can imagine that uh, that's an environment where the teaching moments have, were very intimate pre-COVID. Uh, let's say Indian classical dance, the teacher would be there with students teaching them these ancient dance techniques face to face um, uh, and so on. And so, so clearly with lockdown, it's proved a huge disruption. Uh, and you had teachers who were trained in a very traditional manner of uh, what we call the Guruko Logharana mm -hmm. system. Again, it's small intimate groups in a room, being able to exactly see what the student has been doing. And I think we've just been just so impressed how the teachers, uh, who these very traditional orthodox teachers have pivoted to the online world and found ways to conduct online classes of classical dance, singing, language, uh, by going through each person, letting them play a piece of music, hearing it, giving them feedback, uh, and what we've noticed is the reach of the bhavan has gone beyond the south of England. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have students dialing in from the US, from India, from across Europe now. We ran a series of online lectures over the summer. I had given some on ancient knowledge for modern living, and we had reaches uh, in the thousands uh, for, those, for those lectures. Uh, I ran a summer school for Vedic chanting, chanting the ancient texts of India in the traditional manner. Uh, and I had students from all over the world. And we just have realized at the executive committee that we can't let that go when the world reopens and we, we continue to have that close quarter teaching in the facility, in the building in London. How do we stay connected with the, with, with the broader family that's now been opened up to the bhavan that we never really um, anticipated we would have that kind of reach. Uh, and so uh, I think our biggest learning is we're very much constrained again by our ambition as to what's possible. And, and 
and I would I would really challenge all of us to 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 think uh, very creatively of what the new future could hold and how we can balance online with in person learning experiences because I think the the Bhavan experience was has been quite a, uh, a profound eye opener and inspiration to all of us in, involved. So I just wanted to share that slightly different example. We do run degree courses as well, by the way, uh, master's degrees in, in in various language and arts. So so we have high levels of learning as well as should we say in, in you know more social learning for of Indian classical dance and our students perform on the BBC uh, at various events uh, to a very high standard. So. Uh, we, we've been astonished how much we've been able to achieve. We thought we'd have lost everything, but it's actually shown us new ways of how to move forward. Thanks for giving me the chance to, to, to add that to the discussion. Thank you for sharing, Subham. And uh, Rassi, I think you had one more question, I believe for Nico, before we probably have to move on to uh, the next session as well. So um, if you wouldn't mind sharing that uh, question. Yes, um, my apologies, I've lost the name of the participant now, but Nico, one of the participants said that they fully agree with you that the move should be online, but maybe you can comment on the on the challenge of supporting faculty and um, building their capacity to move online. Um, if you can elaborate more about that, please. Um, when you say capacity to move online, um, uh, well, let, let, let me tell you what, what I think, because I think our time may be running out <laughs> rapidly. Um, I think that the main thing is that through a process of, of uh, proper planning and a proper development process and proper training, what is needed at the right times and also uh, evaluating through uh, uh, you know, surveys and things beforehand, you can establish what is needed uh, by the academic. Um, academics usually they, they do not have a, a problem with the, the content and those things but a lot of institutions feel that the academic also needs to do the building of the course online now um, we, uh, we we deploy specific measures to to make it very easy for academic to build online but at most institutions I think it will be a case where each academic will try to create a learning experience for the student that would be inconsistent um, the whole time. Uh, every time they go to a new course, um, it would be uh, uh, something like, remember back in the day when animated GIFs came into play and every PowerPoint you would see at a conference will have animated GIFs every slide. Um, and, and often what happens is as soon as an academic, and I count myself under those, um, as soon as we get a new toy, everything is about that toy. We, we put it in every way. We want to add it every, every way. Problem is everybody's not exposed to the same thing all the time. So every time you get a new academic, there's new um, novelty things. So we need to, uh, across the country, ensure that academics are trained to, to focus on achieving outcomes, learn uh, or teach them how to, to create a learning experience for the student, how to then have a, a uniform way of presenting the content throughout a program to ensure consistency for the student and ensuring student success in the end because they're not wasting time mm -hmm. and also teaching to the outcomes that i think is the most important thing so as soon as you have that if you can get your academics to plan and and develop a properly um, a, well a proper course then if you have a good ID team in your institution, a good videographer, all those role players will do the rest. They will make it beautiful and consistent. But um, uh, I mean, the upskilling is all about just changing mindsets. I, I've been in so many sessions where we would start with a new partner. And when you walk in, you can see resistance immediately. Uh, someone who's close to retirement. Uh, being dead set against this online thing because it will never work. It's absolutely impossible. About 20 minutes into the first session of presenting to them how it works, you can immediately see a change in their facial expressions and you will suddenly see them starting to write things down. And usually those guys are the ones that do the best job in the end because they, they suddenly realize, but wait, 
these things that you are showing us isn't that difficult. And suddenly they are open to a new world, a new way of doing things that they embrace. And, you know, that that is building that capacity of that person, with that person giving them some new toys to play with. And with, of course, within a, a set environment. Uh, so it, I think it's all about mind shift again, change management, and then ensuring proper processes because you can upskill and, and build the capacity at your institution. Thank you. Sir. I think that's a very complete answer and uh, very detailed. Thanks for sharing. Rasi, was that it? I think maybe we should uh, be cognizant. We've only got half an hour left and still some material to get through, but I'm happy to let it go. I'm, you know, I'm enjoying the, the, the feedback from the floor. So, so very happy to, to fast forward there. So, but I think we can move on to Louis' session. I think that was it, Rasi, uh, but do correct me if I'm wrong. There was one more question from Oliver, but I believe this will be answered after Louis' session. Perfect, perfect. So then we'll go straight to Louis. Uh, and thank you again for being involved and thanks for the participation to date. Um, the question for you, Louis, is around social, social justice and equitable access has been a reality that many universities have had to prepare for. How did your university handle this and what were some of the learnings uncovered both in terms of students and educators? So if you wouldn't mind speaking to that and unpacking the conversation for us as well. Thanks, uh, Ewan, it's a pleasure. Uh, yes, just before I get to the practical side, maybe I want to say a, a few things that where I agree with Niku and others. Uh, I've also heard some of my colleagues uh, in South Africa say, and well, obviously thinking that somewhere in the future, we will again return to normal. And with that, they mean the old way of doing things. And uh, I do not think so. I, uh, or let me rather say, perhaps I hope that some of the COVID changes that happened are, are permanent. And I think uh, together with uh, Nico, that the change uh, to digital remote learning was long overdue. And I'm not talking about the, the current emergency uh, learning and teaching, but uh, more digital uh, remote learning. And uh, we were very slow as higher education institutions. We were extremely slow to adapt to technology disruption. He was talking about, uh, I was at that same conference in 2004. And I, uh, I missed his, uh, his uh, presentation, but in any case, uh, we were very, uh, very slow. And if you look around you, I think, uh, the, and this is the major topic about the digital disruption, Many companies have gone under due to the inability to adapt uh, to newer technology. If you think of Kodak and Polaroid, they didn't adapt to the new technology of uh, digital photography. Recently, last year, Thomas Cook Travel Agency, because they were still focusing on old travel brochures and um, the old way of doing bookings via a travel agent, while the world has moved on to electronic bookings and doing it on the web. Now, I think uh, if we as higher education institutions are not going to adapt, I think we are in serious trouble in the future. But the problem is like it was also said earlier, uh, it is not the students and it's not technology that's the problem, but quite often it's the staff that is the problem. But I still believe COVID uh, forced us uh, of course, uh, into a certain direction. And uh, we had to look at our culture anew. We had to look at our teaching and learning tools. And of course, all of that that is incorporated in that. But there's one important thing that we shouldn't forget that if we want to succeed as higher education institutions in the digital era, or the so-called new normal that people uh, refer to, what we need is a robust and reliable access to current and emerging technologies and digital resources. We need connectivity for all students, including those with special needs. We need connectivity for lecturers, for staff, for management, for all of them, uh, even working from home. And of course, we need uh, great lecturers that understand technology. And that is perhaps one of the bigger problems. But to bridge socioeconomic gaps and to truly support digital learning for all students, 
any initiative, uh, whether it's emergency or whether it's pure online in the future uh, or digital uh, teaching and learning, we will have to make sure that students have sufficient bandwidth uh, and of staff, of course, and connection speeds to allow proper teaching and learning to allow it to occur anytime on any place with limited interruptions uh, because of infrastructure problems. I think that is, that for me is extremely important. Otherwise, as, uh, as we have seen, it can be extremely disruptive. But now uh, there's a tough problem uh, in developing countries when we start to talk about technology and when you start to talk about broadband and bandwidth and speeds, uh, I think one of the toughest decisions for our rural citizens is, should I stay in my home community or should I rather go to the urban area where there are study opportunities and where there are much more career opportunities? And, and in our case, there's a, a huge movement like everywhere in the world to the cities, but I think it's a false choice that the young people are making at the moment. Uh, when some, and I'm roughly saying 40% of jobs can be done from home. Most of the study programs in South Africa, in fact, can uh, be done from home. Uh, if we are just changing the way that we are doing things at universities. Well, at least if the internet is good enough. Now, let me say something about that and, uh, and the access. In many parts of South Africa and elsewhere around the world, I believe, I, I, I've even read that it was a problem in some parts of America. Um, so it must be elsewhere in the world as well, rural areas. Access to high-speed broadband internet is, is very limited in South Africa and non-existent. And I can also tell you, and it's a shame, that telecom companies are not interested in offer better services. Uh, because the profits are too slim. And at the, at, at the time of pandemic forced remote learning, broadband is a critical need. There was a time in South Africa when government enforced technology provision in rural areas as a precondition for any company to be awarded, awarded a new spectrum license. But somehow in South Africa, this disappeared. And this created uneven access uh, in South Africa, which is a major uh, problem for us. And uh, in students that have been disadvantaged because of a certain history in South Africa and uh, because of economic reasons, and now even worse because of COVID and the influence of COVID and many that lost work in South Africa, we've got a very high, more than 50% people that are without work. Uh, it is difficult for some students to, to participate. So what did we do practically? I was involved, like I said, at the University of the Western Cape. Uh, we had a campaign where we said, leave no student behind. And I'm, what I want to emphasize is that it's not only about technology. It's easy to think, yes, it's only about technology, give them access and so, but it's not. It was. It was also that we had to change our promotion rules to give them uh, more access, to change the way that uh, things are, do, uh, are, are being done, uh, to, to, to create additional support services, to create counseling services. There were so many things that we had to do. And with promotion rules, for instance, I mean that where they uh, couldn't write in, uh, some assessment because they didn't have uh, adequate marks, uh, now that was allowed to give them some sort of second chance. So we changed all of that uh, to make it easier for the students, more flexible. And what we also had to do was, uh, because many students didn't have uh, uh, computers to access uh, the, the material and the resources, so uh, the university acquired 20,000 uh, laptop computers they negotiated for a good price uh, and it was not uh, that expensive mm -hmm. and some of them were financed by bursaries and others by the university the university immediately st started a fund quite uh, uh, it was within a few weeks it was a few million strong uh, by uh, mostly from alumni and staff members 
and that fund was used to buy the computers for for the students um, and although the uh, that is important for south africa the, your learning management system and your library and important digital resources were all uh, zero rated by the telecom company so no student who accessed these materials uh, had to pay for data but still uh, uwc provided a generous amount of free data per month as well it was paid uh, initially we loaded it onto the sim cards of students but later uh, we've changed to a new system of reversed uh, charging and then on the other side of the uh, the coin uh, because our lecturers were most of them were not ready for this uh, emergency online teaching and learning we had to provide very uh, quick uh, special training to ensure that the students uh, get quality uh, education and uh, we had to give them major support with regard to instructional design assessments proctoring and that is all done by the center for innovative educational technologies and uh, so and there were many more uh, things but i don't want uh, to take up too much uh, of the time uh, to summarize uh, even i can say equitable access for me means much more than just technology much more than providing devices much more than just connectivity it also means giving every student the opportunity to learn from teachers or lecturers if you want to who understand how to use technology to both enhance learning and create quality learning experiences for students who need it and that for me is important is we quite often think about access as, as uh, equitable access as, as just the technology side it's much more than that so with that let me stop for now Thank you, Louis, and wonderful insight as well. I believe Rassi has a question from the floor as well, from uh, Dr. Seal, actually. So, uh, Rassi, if I could pause to you, please. Thank you, Ewan. Um, Louis, um, Oliver, the question that Oliver has posed, um, you have answered it listening to you. Uh, you have answered it to a great deal. You've, you've spoken to it, but I'm going to read it because I believe this will, this will also help us to, to, uh, to create more discussion around what you've shared. So Oliver is, um, he makes a statement and then he asks the question. He says, how do we deal with the social inequalities in South Africa of access to data and technology mediated learning for students in the rural communities and informal settlements? Is this current approach in South Africa, are we not with this current approach in South Africa, are we not perpetuating the economic divide with the digital divide? Yeah, I, uh, Rassi, I, I have answered it uh, to some extent. Uh, the major thing is, if you ask me in South Africa, uh, yes, we are perpetuating it. Uh, because government is neglecting their role that they need to play by forcing uh, uh, I believe the telecommunication companies uh, to also provide uh, uh, access, uh, quality access and broadband and internet in, in certain rural areas because they, they, they have the very profitable city. So they have to do it and, and cross subsidize. But that's on, on a government side. On a university side, uh, for instance, where I was involved, uh, it is much different, and I think we left no, no student behind. Uh, everyone had dat data, everyone, and if they were in a rural area, there were a, a few, a very small number of students. I think it was not only 3,000 students, and as soon as it was possible, those students were transported back to the university, and uh, we hosted them at the university and uh, so that they could have proper access to electronic means. So, in our case uh, in the university and uh, we've had for instance the highest uh, uh, assessment participation ever uh, even better than uh, when students were on campus so we haven't left any student behind uh, so i do not think that it is necessary uh, to perpetuate the economic divide um, 
uh, to create uh, uh, the digital divide or digital exclusion, as we say also, uh, we have gone f decided for social inclusion very specifically. Uh, but yes, I want to say it is something that we need to work on in South Africa and, and do something about. Thank you, thank you, Louis. Thank you, Ivan. Ivan. Thanks, Rossi, and thanks, everybody. I'm also cognizant of the fact that we are getting to uh, the last little bit. So I think what we'll do is, if all okay, we'll skip uh, the next slide and maybe go to Baz uh, for his last session, and then ask uh, all the participants maybe just to make a closing remark, and then uh, we'll. I think we'll answer all the questions either in written form if we have time. Uh, we'll approach them. But if we do Baz's last one, and then we will start again um, with Lund University, just with some closing remarks, and, and give everybody a chance to close out the session with their final thoughts as well. Um, so Baz, if I can maybe pass to you for the final part before closing remarks. So the question, Baz, is for IR analytics, increased automation and data monitoring in education were some of the biggest trends pre-COVID. Do you think that these trends will continue post-pandemic? And do you think educators are now better prepared for the questions they will raise and the issues they may create? Um, yeah, another another big one. Uh, <laughs> when you're not you're not sparing us. Today. <laughs> no. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think the it's almost the uh, rhetorical question, right? Mm. So, is more data going to be used? Uh, is is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think um, you know data, so you know what's going on, and then acting on the truth uh, is is always better than flying blind, as I as I said earlier. Mm. Um, I think I do think that we need to make a big difference here between educators and the rest of the people in the academic uh, ecosystem and the organizations like staff members and uh, administrators and people that uh, do alumni engagements, um, recruiting, etc. Um, so I think that the uh, the increased analytics are we're starting to see a build up with the advent of learning platforms of uh, of historical data and uh, starting to predict um, you know, what are the, the, the paths of successful students, what are the students that may need a little bit extra help. Mm -hmm. uh, the perennial question that uh, the students that ask for help are usually the wrong ones because they know they have a problem, uh, which is the first step to fixing it. It's, it's the quiet ones that sort of slowly disappear and disengage. Uh, those are the ones that you wanna spend your resources on. And I think that's, uh, that's very good to at least get those indicators and, and use those more. Um, without any uh, value judgment of that, right? Because somebody can be completely unparticipative in discussion boards. That's just maybe the way that they learn. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we should uh, we should never just go on the data alone. Uh, but it does help you to uh, to poke a little bit further and, uh, and explore some areas. So I think on the on the educator side, there there's more and more now uh, available because before. You know, if somebody raises an eyebrow uh, in a classroom in the back in the dark, you don't see it. Uh, now you have systems that can do social listening to um, discussion board entries. And then from there, sort of interpret, like, are people engaged? Are they positive? Are they negative? Are they not engaged? Are they learning? Are they progressing? Are they staying behind? Uh, so you can, you can direct your efforts a lot better, I think, uh, as opposed to having, indeed, like a lecture theater with 40, 50 people with all laptops facing you. Uh, so there's there's more data that you can uh, then work, but but tread carefully there because obviously data privacy uh, and, and taking actions based on that data is still uh, a very new field. Uh, and everybody should, should find their own, I think, um, pathway through that. Um, on the other side, like the, the support of the rest of the institution, uh, what we've seen in, in all countries almost is the government um, taking steps back either by necessity for budgets and, and economic impact or by design because they are uh, more leaning to the sort of the right side of government where they say this let let the market deal with it and education now more and more is not something that people do uh, to have a starting qualification for the job market but it's something that they need to continue to invest in uh, throughout their careers and uh, you start to see it with the with the business schools who who very much got hit Initially, because their their plush campuses with star chefs and and beautiful environments are, were not so much of a draw. Uh, when when you have to fly there and get into a hotel where they won't serve you food and you're in the classroom with people that, 
you know, especially in the height of the pandemic, you, you don't know uh, if, if it's safe enough. Mm. Uh, so they've moved that away from the, let's say, one time high ticket item to the um, education for life. And, and that circle of engagement from finding the right students that you know will be successful to nurturing your alumni so they come back and give back and, uh, and, and continue to reskill. Um, is I think uh, a key element and yeah those analytics will will quickly tell you that we've seen a race uh, for lots of institutions that basically did nothing with their alumni uh, you know they have some data store on a USB somewhere with a hundred thousand uh, graduate level data uh, sometimes they have the first employer and a little bit about income level but that's about it you know then the last known address will be the the parental address um, so looking at that and starting to mine that, that, uh, treasure trove to see, you know, where are people that want to give back either as internships or, uh, be a mentor or a coach, or maybe give a grant to individual students or come back as a teacher, uh, or come back to learn, uh, is, is too good to pass up on. So I think we're, we're getting out of that treadmill of get them in, get them out quick towards becoming that. As uh, you know, as Stephen Downs in the quote said, uh, become more of a mindset than a process than a place, um, and that data of, of where you direct your efforts is is going to be uh, more and more needed. And I, I guess less controversial when you're um, analyzing your funnel conversion, like what what is the what is the likelihood of people that ask for information to actually come and register and pay and study. Um, there, I don't think there's any debate and that's very similar to the experience you have on commercial websites where, you know, you get asked like people that looked at this also looked at this. So do you want to add on this? Or maybe you're interested in the following, uh, in the educational process. I think that's a, that's a very, very new field, as I mentioned earlier, where, where everybody will have to, you know, find their own moral compass and decide what's right for them to use. But, uh, the, what we'll start to see in one of the institutions I work with very closely is the. Catalan Open University, that's been an online only institution for 25 years. Uh, and they have nothing but data uh, because every interaction, literally every interaction uh, happens through a system. Um, I think the most the close that they get to analog is somebody, um, you know, picking up the phone and calling their advisor. Uh, but apart from that, everything is through, um, through written and, uh, and online engagement. Uh, and they have a lot of that data that they're now uh, really trying to uh, trying to mine to make sure that they continue to compete and grow and uh, and, and give great experiences to their students. Perfect. Thanks, Buzz. And definitely something that we could go into a lot more detail with and, and definitely a, a subject that could have been teased out a little bit more, but grateful for those insights and, and in the interest of time. Unfortunately, I won't allow any further questions on that, but, but definitely very interesting to hear what some of the colleagues around Europe are doing and some of the things that you're seeing. Uh, we only have uh, seven minutes left. So if I could maybe ask, instead of all the panelists to do a summary, if I could maybe ask uh, Maria just to kind of make a, a closing remark, uh, then we can maybe Maybe ask Subhanu and then uh, Niku and um, Louis to just make their very short closing remarks or calls to actions or observations, but very short and, and try to keep it quite brief, um, if you wouldn't mind, please, just so we can get to the uh, to the end of, of the call with our people overrunning. But Maria, if I could maybe ask you just uh, yeah. closing remarks or calls to action or oh, uh, whatever you'd like uh, to close out as final thoughts. Yeah. No, uh, so so uh, it's all always such a learning experience to listen to other speakers from other universities. We have our differences, but it's uh, we are we have surprisingly much the same same challenges, and uh, we managed to get through uh, this first period. But we will keep on working on uh, uh, getting richer, more interactive learning digital environments uh, and supporting teachers and learners uh, at the front um, yeah i think that's that's pretty much it thank you and thanks to the team for, for taking time out and, and being part of this uh, transnational conversation <laughs> Subhanu, so, if I can maybe call you to make some final remarks. I know you've been engaged on some of the topics. Uh, we would like to have heard a bit more from you, but unfortunately time didn't allow. But if I could uh, ask you for some closing remarks and thoughts. Absolutely. Uh, first, thank you for facilitating such a wonderful session. I hope it was of value to, to the audience. Three things I would like to, to leave as takeaways. The first 
is that if we go back to doing things the way we used to, I do believe it's a missed opportunity. I, I think we think to think of a reset to the future and keep what really has uh, come through as new ways through this uh, COVID period. The second is, uh, is that we're really only constrained by our ambition as to what's possible. And, and this idea of just don't put the constraints too early on, 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 on your thinking of, of what you could do is an important one. And then the last point I would just make is um, actively seek out new partners and, 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 and new coalitions of the willing. Uh, you, if you open your heart and mind, you may be surprised where the answers could lie, uh, could lie and could create some, some really fascinating new collaborations for the future. Thanks for letting me participate today. Thanks, Yvonne. Thank uh, and thanks for your input uh, as well. Uh, Nico, if I could call on you for a short closing remark, yes. uh, observation uh, or comment. I'll do a very short 20 to 30 <laughs> minute summary. Um, I, I, think, I think going forward um, with, with this experience that the, the lecturers have had in this um, online environment, and I'm doing this because, um, as, I, as we said before, it's not really fully uh, online programs really, um, it's an emergency thing. We will, we will see that academics will be more open to, to the possibilities and to, to actually delve into online learning, uh, a lot uh, less scared of it than they were in 2019. Um, I think a major thing would be universities and university leadership to embrace and accept the change and then um, actually support it uh, more uh, there's a lot of support, but I don't think it's a primary focus at any institution yet, um, in South Africa specifically. Um, I think it's important that we realize that our students now already live online. They, um, they are already there 24 hours a day. Mm. So they, they expect a move to happen. But let's not worry about them necessarily. Let's worry about the students that will be coming in in 2025. They will demand it. They won't know um, other things. They will really be very much living their full lives online and we need to get ready for them. And I don't think we should wait for COVID 2023, COVID 2025 before we, we start with that. So, um, I, I mean, uh, I hope that this group of, of, of people uh, attending will really push it at the institution so that we can really get online and at least so that my prediction and my, my uh, things in 2004 will become true. So that I can say in 2004, I said this. So yes. 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being part of the panel. And you know, I feel too bad. We only have two minutes left, but I'm going to open up to Baz and to uh, Louis to close us out. But Baz, maybe uh, just very short, you know, thoughts, observations, call to action uh, for the panel. Um, please, if you wouldn't mind just... Uh, uh, speaking a few a few few words. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, and I, I think the the word equitable access has has come up a, a number of times. And uh, and for me, that is the big learning. Not not everybody has um, you know, and, and sort of just take a step step back in my thirty seconds. Uh, not everybody has the same perspective on this, right? So when we talk about equitable access, initially my mind thinks to people with visual disabilities, people who have other learning styles. Then you go one step further, you think the economic situation, uh, do they have the machine, the bandwidth, the time to dedicate to studies when they're mixing it with work? Maybe they're, you know, getting to campus is a way to get away from their other commitments and, and focus on studies. Mm -hmm. And then the home situation, um, are, are there kids around? Are, is it socially accepted? Is it the first generation student? So we have all of these other elements that uh, we should not forget when we, uh, when we see this sort of push online and uh, I, I believe that uh, universities you know sort of duty of care uh, will, will need to be expanded and data is a great way to do it to focus your efforts on on the ones that truly need help versus the ones that that really know how to ask for it uh, but that for me has been a, a key takeaway that uh, no matter which country you are no matter which uh, educational institution you're with uh, equitable access should always be first on your mind uh, just the, the complexity that you find is, is just different situation by situation but uh, but don't think it's uh, because we're in different countries with different economic circumstances we don't uh, we don't have to deal with it we certainly have to and uh, i look forward to universities stepping up actually that kind of coaching and, and pastoral care 
uh, also to prevent uh, very tragic um, accidents with uh, with their student body, uh, where people are not able to catch up and and deal with this sort of social exclusion. So. Uh, the university as, as that uh, not place of learning, but as that mindset and service and structure uh, is, is the takeaway for me. Thanks, Baz. And Louis, if I can leave to you, uh, I'll pass my time. I won't do a summary. Uh, <laughs> I'll pass it on to you and, and just ask you to close us out. And I'll just say as a preemptive thank you to everybody and a small reminder to the participants to please join uh, the plenary on the summit platform. Uh, so I'll close from my side. And Louis, if I could leave you for the final remarks, and we should get everybody uh, to the next session on time. If you wouldn't mind, Louis, just uh, wrapping up for us. Thank you. Okay. Um, with uh, all that has been said, I think there are a few things left for us to do. And uh, yes, of course, we should not lose uh, the momentum. But what we now need to sit down at universities is to, to really sit down and rethink our digital strategy, strategies at, and our teaching and learning policies, our assessment policies, and all of those. We also need to think with uh, equitable access uh, in mind to, to really think again about how digitally literate uh, and empowered our, are our students and our lecturers. And remember that digital literacy, I think, involves much more than just operating digital devices and software and so forth, but also includes a variety of complex cognitive, motor, sociological and emotional skills. And then, uh, uh, and I'm trying to do it fast, to say uh, that a man we also need management that understands the digital era and the different character of student-centered flexible online learning that requires a greater flexibility in terms of administrative rules. And there's much more than just the teaching side of it. There's also on the admin side. And we need, lastly, faster processes to keep the interest of prospective students. Otherwise, we lose them. Uh, and may I use this forum to say, uh, I think it's scandalous that universities have to wait 18 to 24 months for government to accredit any new course. By then, it's old. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And a final thank you from my side to Yousef for the opportunity, to all our panelists who've dialed in from across EMEA. Really appreciate it. Thank you also to the audience members who uh, have been so engaged and asking questions and, and continue to follow. Um, we'll close the session. And again, just a small reminder to please join the plenary on the summit platform. Thank you from our side and uh, see you soon. All the best. Bye. Thank you.